So this comes in frequently when you're using very rigid samples. Um, it also comes, uh, it happens when you're using maybe the fixed upper joint. But so just say when you have no sample in the uh, grips itself, that's usually when you want to zero the force on there. So you have the force zeroed, there's no sample in there, uh, there's no force on the grips, zero the force. You load your sample in, you tighten your sample, Frequently, there's some force that shows up resultant of you gripping it in there. Your natural reaction might be to zero the force. You actually don't want to do that because that's an actual force that the sample itself is seeing at that point in time. Either, like I said, due to uh, slight misalignments in the grip fixturing or um, slight uh, misshapenness of the sample itself. Something that you can do is the force zero hold. And essentially what that does is it modulates the crosshead height to remove the force on that sample. So for this sample, it's not that big of a deal. It's only negative five newtons on a 100, capacity, 100 newton capacity load cell that's you know, kind of within the noise. That being said, if it's a large, rigid sample, um, that value might be higher. That's where you might want to employ that force a little bit. All right, so before we start the test, something that we'd want to check is to make sure our upper limit switch is in place. Um, and essentially, the We've gone over the importance of the lower limit switch, such that if you're kind of coming down and don't want your grips or your fixturing to collide with each other, um, the importance of this guy up here is that if the brake detect does not go off and you don't have your software limit set up appropriately, the crosshead will keep on moving up. It doesn't necessarily know, especially since we've zeroed it, exactly where it is. So it actually would kind of move off the top of the instrument. Um, and that has happened once before a polymer supplier wanted to get just a little more extension out of their frame, so they took this off entirely. And somebody wasn't paying attention one day, and the crosshead ran itself right off the frame. Um, so that's the purpose of setting the upper load switch. I'm sorry, the upper limit switch. Um, if we were paying attention earlier, we would have set the lower limit switch up for the grips. Um, in this case, it doesn't really matter. If you're using a high-speed return function back to zero, it would be a good idea to set up um, the lower limit switch off your tensile grips. So right now, I think we're good to go to start the test. So I wasn't going to use the camera right now, only because the sample's not oriented at a 45 degree uh, to, the, um, to the sample itself right now. I kind of wanted to go through kind of a workflow of a basic sample and then kind of expand upon that. Let's see if we can turn it on through the way analyze. Load cell, yes, you would need to index that. The top load cell is already rotated, yes.
So we're kind of getting, you know, kind of off on a tangent. I wanted to do the TRV, but it's after kind of doing the basic software review, but we'll try to get it up and running right now. The, the TRV exit has this external box that you need to have on um, prior to uh, powering on the frame. Essentially, it allows everything to kind of communicate with each other. So here's the video feed from the TRVUX right now. Um, it's not centered on the sample, so it's not really representative of what, of what it will look like. But essentially, um, and again, this is not a good example, you have little boxes that you kind of center upon the markers. Um, and then your values right here will kind of increase uh, based off of the contrast of the instrument. As Majette is setting up, uh, it is nice to have a black background to increase the contrast of the color. So that's kind of a brief introduction to the um, to the TRVX scan. I'm going to actually go back to our previous method because I think that right now it's currently taking data off that camera and the data wouldn't be correct. So real quick, I'm going to go back to the previous method that we wrote. If you were to capture the string data from that camera, are you able to save those images? Yes. You can save it with things. So you could essentially use that camera for a speckle pattern. Could you, can you take stream simultaneously from the crosshead and the camera? It would be a separate software package. So the GOOM, the GOOM, the GOOM yeah. the, what is the GOOM software? Um, correlated. So there's correlated solutions, but then there's also um, Trillium. 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 Yeah. So they actually make free 2D, uh, 2D DIC software. The 3D DIC software is much more expensive than free. Um, but like I said, it's it's a different module that. So you can get the um, image data that you can replay within um, Trapezium software, but to export that data such that it can be used and input into a um, trillion or correlated solutions, um, that's another module. And we can talk, if that's something that you're interested in, we can talk to sales about getting you set up into something like that. Um, but right now, I mean, Shimatsu is working on an integrated solution with Trapezium X and a 3D DIC, or 2D DIC rather. But as it is right now, it's, it's separate, such that you'd have to export the video data um, into a third-party software, whether, like, like you say, it's correlated or trillion or go, um, then to analyze it there. If we were to use just the two points on the sample, it does take strain data from the cross-site and the camera? It does do both. Just as set up? Okay, yes. so we can do it from there. Start a test. Mm 
secondary force or hold or remove the test on the, or the force on the sample. Now we will start the test. Oh, and since we restarted the frame, we didn't do the eCal. Ideally, we would remove the sample to do the eCal, um, but in this scenario, just for uh, speed's sake, I'm just going to eCal it with the sample in there. But just to know as a good standard practice to not have the sample in there when you calibrate it. Another thing to note when you're starting the um, test that's a common mistake is that, as I was showing earlier, to be able to modulate the crosshead, you take it in and out of manual mode. If it's in manual mode, you can't start the test. Now we're going to want to zoom in because it didn't auto scale correctly. So now we have our stress strain curve. It's identifying the max value right here, uh, the break value right here. Uh, this is where we saw the necking. If we kind of go to our data processing values, it is showing you know, our break force. So this broke at 735 newtons. The stress and strain values probably aren't necessarily correct since we didn't have the right grip to grip gauge length and the cross section wasn't entered incorrectly. Um, but I think this is a good demonstration of um, writing the method, loading the sample, starting the test. As you guys write more methods, uh, the workflow does become kind of simpler. I think that the software is kind of intuitive, but it also has a great degree of variability. Is there any questions so far? In the method test or pure test, how do you have to actually set up for the test? So for a PO test, there's a couple things you could do. Let's look at it. Create the method. So PO test varies in your testing um, parameters itself, but also mainly in your data processing. So it gives you data processing points. Uh, most commonly is what you would see in a peel test. Um, right now, what you have the setup to do is you could do a 180 degree peel. Um, you could also do a 90 degree T peel. Um, I'm sorry. So you could do a T peel where you have, you start your peel, uh, you put your substrate in one of the grips, and then what you're de-adhering in the other grip. Uh, also, you could have a more solid substrate sitting like this where you're de-adhering from this way. We also make a 90 degree peel test where it's a fixture where it's a sled that's attached that as the crosshead moves up, uh, the substrate moves so that the de-adherent is always 90 degrees as opposed to a different angle like this. So you can do peel testing with the current setup you have um, if you wanted to do uh, a T-peel test or a 180 degree peel test.